and welcome to Rays of Hope, a program brought to you by the Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center. I'm your host for today, Mary Foley, and I'm so glad you've joined us for today's program. I hope that you find it interesting and informative as we take a closer look at trauma, the effects of trauma on children, adolescents, and adults, behaviors and signs and symptoms often associated with a traumatic experience. And of course, we'll have a discussion on the importance of receiving professional and appropriate intervention if you are victimized in some way traumatically. And here to have that discussion with us today are two women that I have great respect for. Uh, we have Dr. Renee Duncan from Murray State University. She's the chair of the Department of Psychology. She graduated with her PhD from Florida State University and is a licensed clinical psychologist. And so she's an expert in her own right. She also worked for the National Crime Victim Center for a while. And so I think she'll have a lot of interesting and informative information to give to you, the viewer today. And alongside her, Lori Wells Brown. She is the director of clinical services at the Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center. She received her master's degree from Murray State University and has worked closely with and trained under Dr. Renee Duncan. And so they make a fabulous team and we're glad to have them today. So welcome Thank you. to both of you. Well, trauma is a word that we hear a lot and we hear in a lot of different contexts. Could you take just a moment um, to start by telling the viewer, what is trauma? Well, the trauma that we think about when we're uh, working with individuals who have uh, been a victim of a crime mm -hmm. or uh, sexual assault or something along that line, we're looking at an event that was very extreme, okay. uh, where the person felt helpless, uh, where the person may have been physically injured, but that's not necessary, okay. um, and where the experience was um, so frightening and overwhelming mm -hmm. that uh, just by nature of that helplessness, um, fear, perhaps injury, and overwhelming um, uh, emotions mm -hmm. of dread and, mm -hmm. and powerlessness, and that by nature there's going to be some sort of uh, a psychological impact. So for our purposes, we're not necessarily focusing on things like uh, a breakup of a relationship. We're talking about events that are much more powerful mm -hmm. and where there is more of the hopelessness, helplessness, and fear that go along with it. Okay, and having said that, and this would probably be directed to both of you, having explained to the viewer what trauma is, you know, it doesn't sound like a, a good thing. You know, it sounds like a very difficult thing to go through. Why personally did you choose to sort of specialize in this area or to assist in this area of all the fields you could have chosen. Could mm -hmm. you let the viewer get to know you a little bit on why, why this area? Uh, well, I think uh, I got into it in, in a bit of a roundabout way. Okay. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was actually working with prisoners. So people who had committed um, or inflicted these traumas on other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, after working with the, the prisoners for a while, I decided that uh, although I could have an impact with that group, I thought my services would be better used uh, with the folks who had been victimized by these individuals. And so that's when I started working at the National Crime Victim Center uh, to get training and expertise oh, in that group. So uh, for me, it was kind of a roundabout way of getting into <laughs> to, uh, this, this field. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Lori? I mean, you've worked with trauma victims for what, close to eight years now. Right. Um, what about that population were you interested in? Well, I think maybe much like Dr. Duncan, I am, um, was working at the Women's Center at Murray State and a lot of the clients I, were, I was seeing were young women who mm -hmm. had experienced previous traumas and were really struggling at that time in their life. Maybe they you know, had just come to the university and it was just a transition mm -hmm. period and were really having a lot of problems and I guess soon began to see maybe the difference that I could make in working with that population mm -hmm. and helping them learn how to cope at that time and what a difference it could make in their lives and and I guess just became interested you know in, in mm -hmm. um, working with people who had been through that and knowing that even though they had been through something traumatic and had been affected that they could really learn to cope and what a difference it could make for the rest of their life. And hopefully you know at this point you know viewers are uh, really listening to, to what we're talking about and maybe they're identifying in one of two ways. Maybe they have been traumatized based on your definition or maybe they're interested in working with this population and so for whatever reason hopefully we've hooked them at this point. Um, talk to me about um, I mean, I would think, just, just as trying to relate with a viewer, I would think that trauma 
might be something that I, that's not a one size fits all, doesn't affect everybody the same. It certainly is no respecter of persons. And so how does it affect people in general? And can you talk a little bit about the developmental process and how does that vary in terms of the effects of trauma? Well, it really does vary from one person to the next. Um, we find that uh, for children, for example, as they are in different developmental stages as far as how old they mm -hmm. are, how mature they are, that it might affect them differently according to where they are developmentally. Mm -hmm. The type of trauma actually okay. makes a difference in how the um, person or how, how they're affected mm -hmm. by the trauma. Um, we also see that um, uh, the resources, the natural resources that the child or the adult has mm -hmm. can protect them from the experience. Uh, it's really kind of amazing to me that there are some people who have had truly horrific things happen to them mm -hmm. and the scars that they receive from that, the emotional scars, are amazingly slight. And so there's this inborn, we call it resiliency, that some people have that make their experience different from um, the experience of other people. And so I think all those things, the age, the type of trauma, resiliency, mm -hmm. those play a role. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think another factor could be the relationship of the individual to the, pers the perpetrator, the person who mm -hmm. inflicted the trauma. Um, I think that the closer you know, the more they trust that person, that it just adds a whole nother dimension of issues that they have to, you know, learn to deal with. In terms of resiliency, you know, for children, you mentioned these factors or these insulators. Can you give us some examples of what might make um, some children more resilient than others? One of the things that I think is so wonderful mm -hmm. is that one of the best predictors of resiliency mm -hmm. is having a healthy relationship with an adult and preferably a healthy, psychologically healthy adult. Mm -hmm. um, it, we would love it if that would be the parent mm -hmm. um, or both parents, um, but sometimes the parents aren't necessarily very healthy. If that child has a healthy relationship with a teacher mm -hmm. um, or uh, they're involved with big brother or big sister um, or a church leader, someone, um, an adult who has that healthy bond with the child, mm -hmm. Uh, that serves as a, a very powerful um, protector mm -hmm. of that child. Even if the child's gone through something horrific, having that relationship is really important. Um, also having support in the community, um, uh, just having a healthy supportive neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing, being physically healthy makes a difference. Um, and I'm sure there are other predictors of resiliency mm -hmm. Uh, that I'm not thinking of. I'm just, you know, thinking of the individuals, just their coping, their ability to mm -hmm. cope. Um, not only what they've learned in relationships with others, but just kind of that innate personality, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of factors I think play a role as well. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about children, most viewers know perhaps maybe, let's just use a child for an example, maybe they are identifying with, with a child that they're thinking of right now that may have been in an abuse situation or potential abuse situation. And so maybe they're thinking, wow, you know, I know that they have a relationship with an adult. Um, how would they, if they are that adult, if you're talking to the adult that is the healthy connection for a child, what would you tell them in terms of helping that child to cope? Talking to the child, I think that's so powerful. What ends up happening very often when we have a child who's experienced a trauma is that the parents or other adults try to protect the child by avoiding talking about what happened. Um, you know, the thinking is that if I talk about it, that's going to make the child think about it, mm -hmm. and that's going to upset the child, and so it'll be a bad thing. Where in reality, the opposite is true. Uh, allowing the child, not forcing the child to talk mm -hmm. about it, but mm -hmm. allowing the child to talk about it when the child wants to talk about it and not running away from that. Um, and that can be hard because if this is a child you have a relationship with, if this is a child you love, hearing that child talk about 
a bad thing that's happened can be very, very painful. Mm -hmm. And so it's a natural thing for the parent to say, oh, here, here, it's going to be better, mm -hmm. or let's not talk about that, let's have a cookie instead, right. or, or something <laughs> like that. Um, you know, it's a natural thing to do, but it's not necessarily the best thing to do. So, so talking is, is just incredibly powerful in these situations. And that tendency avoid, to avoid difficult things really is human nature. But like Dr. Duncan said, that, that really does make things worse, you know, in the long run. Mm -hmm. And um, really teaching that child that it's okay to talk about it and it's okay to, to figure out how to deal with it mm -hmm. is really one of the best things that you can do, talking and listening. And I would mm -hmm. think that you know that was well said talking and listening and that's not a skill necessarily that that adult's got to go to a class and learn they already mm -hmm. got the relationship with the child right. so the ability to talk to them they already do the ability mm -hmm. to listen to them they already do mm -hmm. so are you saying that it's basically just taking those skills they already have mm -hmm. and making themselves available to talk about right. a difficult subject exactly just to be there for the child yes and then I know that this is this probably isn't a one-size-fits-all in terms of behaviors and signs and symptoms and I know that uh, lots of signs and symptoms can be uh, indicators of other things besides trauma but in terms of children what might be some signs and symptoms or indicators that a traumatic experience has occurred well what we will sometimes see is uh, I'll use the fancy term it's called dissociation um, and uh, what that looks like in a child often is where the child stares off into space um, the other kids might say, ah, oh, you're a zombie or mm -hmm. a space cadet or something like that, where the child's just sort of not there. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we might see. We see that in adults as well. Okay. Um, we see what we call traumatic play. And what happens with traumatic play is that the child is, is reenacting the trauma um, with dolls or maybe um, maybe fighting off the bad guy using karate or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and what's happening is the child is t trying to process this trauma through play. Now, of course, the child's not thinking, I'm going to process this trauma, mm -hmm. um, right. <laughs> but it's the child's unconscious way of trying to deal with this. So, so the, the reenactment. Mm -hmm. We also might see a lot of um, fearfulness. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll find children who have been traumatized tend to have many more phobias, many more fears mm -hmm. than the typical child does. Now, all children have fears. That's very, very normal in children. Um, but we'll see a much higher level in children who are traumatized. Mm -hmm. And maybe a child who did not, maybe was not having, experiencing those fears and then b right. begins to have those right. types of fears. Or even maybe a regression back into more childlike behavior. So you know, really a change age. in behavior mm -hmm. from maybe where they were uh, and there's been some sort of change and then following sort of your criteria of some of those things that may manifest themselves. Right. So we might have had a child who was very outgoing who becomes withdrawn mm -hmm. or a child who was always very quiet and um, well behaved who suddenly becomes very um, overactive and gets in trouble a lot. So that change in behavior, mm -hmm. change in behavior doesn't mean a trauma has happened, but it does mean that there's something going on and we need to explore that. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's really one of the best predictors of, um, of distress in a child is when we do see a sudden change in behavior. Okay. And what I would like to do, we're going to take a break in just a few moments, but what I would like to do is when we come back to talk to the viewer about what it looks like in an adolescent, talk to the viewer about what that looks like in an adult, and then um, basically talk to our viewers about other cluster symptoms that may show up, and, and then what, what do we do about it? If, if we do know that we have those or we know someone that has those, what are we going to do and what's the prognosis? And I believe that they're going to be very happy to know that there's hope on the other side. So if you will stay with us, we will be right back to discuss more with Dr. Renee Duncan and Lori Wells-Brown from the Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center as we take a closer look at trauma and how it affects each individual. We'll see you on the other side.
welcome back to the program. We have two very special guests with us today. Dr. Renee Duncan from Murray State University. She's a licensed clinical psychologist. And we have Lori Wells Brown, who is the Director of Clinical Services of the Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center. Welcome back to both of you. Thanks for being here. And we've been talking about trauma, about what it looks like in children, and just sort of establishing for the viewer what trauma is and what it's not. So if we could briefly go in and talk about um, perhaps the viewer is a parent or a friend of an adolescent. Uh, does it look the same? Does it look differently? Can we talk about trauma in terms of that age group? Well, with uh, teenagers, we can see, uh, again, either the becoming much more um, troubled as far as getting into trouble, mm -hmm. um, fighting, that kind of thing, um, or becoming much more withdrawn. Uh, going back to the we would call it externalizing problems where they do become much more okay. um, uh, behavior uh, problem, mm -hmm. problem. <laughs> and um, what we might see is a lot of anger and uh, so the trauma expresses itself through uh, temper tantrums or perhaps sometimes violence um, or just a lot of anger, angry type behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, teenagers who have been sexually assaulted, sometimes we'll see what we call hypersexuality. Um, it's not real clear exactly why this happens, but um, with some teenagers who have had that, uh, that sexual violation, they'll end up being more sexually active than the typical teenager. And, um, and it's not a bad reflection on them as a person at mm -hmm. all. It's a way that they are handling the trauma. Okay. Um, and so that's something that's, that's real important to keep in mind. It's not that they're bad. It's mm -hmm. just um, a, a way of coping that's not necessarily the healthiest way to cope. A lot of depression uh, will happen in the teenagers as well. Depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and related disorders. Right, right, and so the anxiety mm -hmm. and um, uh, when, it, when we look at the relationships that the teenagers get into, mm -hmm. a lot of times some um, unhealthy relationship patterns will develop right. in, in the teenagers who've been traumatized. When and, so, and to make sure that we're clear um, when we use terms like depression and anxiety in terms, of, in, ter in terms of our viewing audience, I mean, those are things like sadness and feeling blue and maybe crying a lot, some mood changes, and anxiety. Can you talk to us a little bit about how anxiety might manifest itself in an adolescent? Um, as far as what that would look like yes. um, for anxiety, well, you might have a child who, I mean, even as a teenager, much like kind of the older, um, younger children that you were describing earlier, that might just develop fears that they didn't have before, okay. phobias, um, just anxiety. I mean, sometimes it's just even being able to see that, that physical anxiety, you mm -hmm. know, just that tension and, and just kind of always on edge. Mm -hmm. um, it, shakiness even. Right. Um, so you might mm -hmm. find uh, that their hands are shaky mm -hmm. uh, or that they have a lot of these physical sensations of mm -hmm. um, a lot of stomach problems or a lot of headaches. Um, now, don't think that a right. teenager who mm -hmm. has headaches has been traumatized, but we do see in trauma survivors a lot of these physical symptoms that mm -hmm. are related to anxiety. Right. So the stomach problems, headaches, dry mouth, shakiness, things like that. Okay. And so for time purposes, if we move on to, to an adult, we have a, a pretty good picture of what it might look like in a child, even though I think it's important to note that it doesn't necessarily indicate trauma, right. but maybe a reason to explore further. The same mm -hmm. with the adolescent. And now mm -hmm. we're at the adult, somebody mm -hmm. that we uh, sort of view and believe that should be able to cope and handle life, and they're adults, and they've kind of lived this life and maybe should know what to do. What does it look like for them, and what would you say to them? Right. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we were born with a manual on this is how you handle trauma? Exactly. Um, and it, the reality is that grown-ups have very similar symptoms as do adolescents mm -hmm. and children even. Mm -hmm. um, so we see the depression, the anxiety. Um, I haven't used the term post-traumatic stress disorder yet, uh, but we see that in all age groups. And what happens with um, post-traumatic stress disorder is that the person uh, is constantly re-experiencing the trauma in their mind. So mm -hmm. they, they're seeing it, they're hearing it, they're thinking about it, they're remembering, they have images, their body might feel as if the mm -hmm. a bad thing is happening again. Um, they try to avoid dealing with the, the trauma, try to avoid thinking about it. Unfortunately, sometimes 
when they're trying to avoid the feelings and the thoughts, they may turn to alcohol or drugs. Um, that's a real common thing with adults and teenagers, teenagers. as well, mm -hmm. is to, uh, we call it self-medicating. Okay. So they're, they're medicating their symptoms with the drugs or alcohol, and that could even be legal drugs, so they might abuse their prescription medication mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's something that we need to be real aware of. And nightmares, uh, nightmares are real common in trauma survivors of all ages. Okay. Um, but just because you're an adult doesn't mean you're immune right. to these nightmares. And the nightmares tend to be extremely vivid to the degree that the person doesn't want to go to bed. And so they might develop insom insomnia because they're so fearful of having to re-experience that trauma when they're sleeping. I see. So it sounds to me like the trauma can have a very deep and lasting effect if it's not addressed. And so perhaps maybe of all the things that we've discussed today, uh, those sound like pretty nasty symptoms and side effects and very disruptive to an individual's life, whether they're a child or they're an adult. And so what I guess I would like to ask uh, both of you, and I guess we could start with you, Lori, uh, at the local community level, you know, you deal with post-traumatic stress disorder and individuals that have been traumatized every day. Um, is there hope? Is there healing? It sounds like this is a very uh, extreme event. How do we help them? to oh, recover. There cer certainly there is hope. Um, I think just if you're thinking about one of the most difficult things I think is kind of that nature of, you know, it is human nature to want to avoid things that are painful and difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and, and on the opposite side of that, the nature of trauma is that it does intrude, it does interfere, and no matter how hard you try to avoid it, it's still there. Mm -hmm. And I think as far as learning how to deal with it, it's just really learning how to cope with that, learning how to recognize, first of all, that these are normal symptoms. They don't feel normal. Mm -hmm. You know, when someone's been through something traumatic, um, people don't react in ways that seem to make sense, mm -hmm. and, but they actually are very normal. They're the things that you do expect people to, you know, to experience, but it doesn't feel that way at the time. And I, right. so I think, first of all, you know, helping someone recognize that what they are experiencing is actually normal, that they are reacting to an abnormal experience, a traumatic experience in a normal way. Um, and just sometimes to see the relief on someone's face, you know, when, sure. they, when, they, when they first realize that, to help them do that, and then to help them learn how to cope with you know, what, what can you do rather than turn to things like drugs or alcohol or other, you know, maladaptive ways of coping to help them try to find healthier ways, you know, to find whether, what, whatever it is within them, that resiliency, that inner strength, whatever they've got mm -hmm. um, to help them and to help them find support from other people too that can help them cope. And Renee, you know, in, in your experiences um, working, you know, at the National Crime Victim Center and then teaching and educating uh, future clinicians and therapists, what do you find? I'm sure you've got some tricks of the trade. What do you find to be helpful and how would you set maybe a parent at ease to sending their child to therapy? It sounds very serious and clinical. Right. What would right. you say to them? Well, I think the, the biggest message that I always try to tell clients and parents of clients and students, everybody, um, is that there is hope. Mm -hmm. As Lori said, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, the, all of the symptoms of trauma are treatable. Uh, when you're experiencing these things, it feels like you're going crazy. This is the term I hear a lot is, I feel over like I'm going over. crazy. Mm -hmm. and But it's not crazy, it's coping. It's it's coping that's not working well, but it's, it's coping. Mm -hmm. And so, treatment works very, very well. And the the term that I don't necessarily use with, with parents, but the term to describe the treatment is exposure. What we do is we help the client, whether it's a child or an adult or a teenager, we help them stop the avoidance that Lori talked about. And the way we do that is by talking about the trauma. Uh, as I said early on, people tend to try to make it better by not talking about it. If right. you don't talk about it, if you don't think about it, it's gonna be okay, but that's just not true. Yeah. And so the treatment involves having them think about it, having them get in touch with all of those feelings, having them uh, manage the feelings without the drugs and alcohol or mm -hmm. anger or hypersexuality mm -hmm. or any of those, those coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that aren't healthy for the individual. Well, and that's normally what humans turn to at the time. You know, a person, if they are yeah. experiencing something traumatic, the ways that they cope with that trauma at the time, um, it, it, they sometimes do whatever they need to do to make it through that traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they kind of becomes the instinct. But after the trauma is over, those things are not 
helpful any longer. So they have to learn to recognize that and to be able to change those, you know, into more helpful ways of coping. And the great thing is that treatment works. Mm -hmm. And um, when a person is in the depths of despair, mm -hmm. it feels completely hopeless and they feel completely helpless. But the treatment really does work. And I think that's probably why we all stay mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. with this population, even though it is hard for us to hear the stories, um, we know that they can get better. And it's hard work though, it's very hard work because who wants to talk about the trauma? Who wants right. to think about it? And that's what treatment involves. It's what treatment requires, but it works so well. So what would you say the difference between being, and we'll have to do this quickly, and I'm gonna put both of you on the spot. What's the difference between being supportive and then recognizing that that individual needs more than support. They need treatment and it takes a professional to do that. How would you help someone balance that? Well, they've got what they need. They're, I'm with them, I'm supportive, but they're not qualified maybe to give mm -hmm. them what they need. What would you say? Well, I think if their life is not going the way they want it to go, mm -hmm. if there's impairment in their social functioning, in their work, um, in their school work, in their relationships. If things aren't going right, then they do need more than just their friends and family. Right. And so I, I think for me that might be the, the key. Right. Well, and I think, you know, sometimes even people seem to be coping okay at first, maybe soon after a trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but what tends to happen is they could have long-term problems. So even if they are, they seem to be doing okay or seem to be bouncing back okay, maybe initially after a trauma, you know, I think it's always a good idea to at least talk to a professional, even if it's for nothing else than just information, you know, to understand what you've been through, the effects of what you've been through, mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe to try to, to gauge, you know, how you're, how you're handling that after a period of time. We are out of time, unfortunately, for today. We have just a few moments left, and I just want to thank you both for being here, for offering your expertise and your information on this matter. And I want to remind the viewer that here locally, you do have a place that you can come and get professional treatment and education and information that you may need. If you are struggling with um, a past trauma or if you know a family or a, a friend of yours needs our assistance, the Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center is available for you and those services are free, they're confidential, uh, there are therapists uh, on staff ready to treat you and to address your situation and so you can get more information by giving us a call at 534-4422 and of course you can call us at 1-800-928-7273 uh, uh, that's toll free to you. There is a 24-hour helpline available and you can reach us on the web and you can see the web address there on your screen. And until we meet again next time, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Mary Foley and this has been the Rays of Hope program brought to you by the Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center.